Hello and welcome to NCBI Labs. So you're very welcome to this week's NCBI Labs live event. Good to be back with you again this week. We have our regular panel of Daniel Dunn, JP Corcoran and Sean Dorn here again. Uh, along with myself, Jude Marr, to talk about the technology that makes a difference to people living with sight loss. Now, on the show this week, we wanted to go a, a slightly different direction and talk about what's being done to ensure the needs of the sight loss community are being taken into account in the technology that hasn't even been developed yet. Of course, one of the most important contributing factors to that is education. So what's happening in educational institutions to support accessibility considerations and to promote awareness of those factors? Well, this week on our show, we're going to find out a little bit about that. And to help us to do that, we're going to be talking to Susan McKeever and Fatma El Tahir from TU Dublin about some of the research and project work that's going on there. And then later on in the show, we'll be talking to Alan Higgins from UCD Business School about the subject of design thinking and how the principles involved can shape the design process, how it promotes awareness of accessibility issues as well. So in a way, we're looking at kind of behind the scenes at the work that's influencing the developments that we'll only really see in years to come. So it's going to be a really interesting subject on the show today. And of course, we want you to be involved as well. So if you have any feedback or questions throughout the show, you can get in touch with us at labs at ncbi.ie or use the question panel if you're connecting through Microsoft Teams. So let's start off our show by wel welcoming our guests from TU Dublin. So we have uh, Susan McKeever, Senior Lecturer in Computer Science, and also Fatma El Tahir, who is a PhD student in the School of Computer Science as well, also from TU Dublin. So you're both very welcome. Maybe we can start with yourself, Susan, if that's OK. You're very welcome yeah. to the show. Hi, John. Can you hear me well? So I can hear you. Yep, perfect. Very good. So thanks for joining us, Susan. And uh, maybe just to start with, Susan, could, could you tell us just a little bit about your role at TU Dublin? Certainly, yeah. Um, and apologies for any background dog barking that you might be able to hear. That's the <laughs> that's the true uh, nature of a live event, as you know. It's the, um, yeah, it's, it's the sound of the pandemic is home, is home <laughs> walking, isn't it? I wouldn't mind. It's not even my dog. Um, OK, so firstly, thank you very much, uh, John Paul, for having us on today. We really appreciate it. And um, my role in TU Dublin, I'm just by title, I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Computer Science in TU Dublin at their city campus. And for those of you who might know where that is, because our name has changed recently, we've just moved up to our campus in Grange Gorman in the city centre and that's where we're, we're based out of now and my role in TU Dublin is apart from my sort of lecturing parts that I do with students in computer science I carry out a lot of research projects with PhD students and industry projects and organisations and I um, do projects particularly in the area of artificial intelligence and that's that's mainly my, what my role is. I can describe more about those projects yeah. now in a couple of minutes, but that's yeah, that's absolutely. Maybe, maybe even just that idea of AI, um, because that's becoming kind of more and more prominent, isn't it? Really, it, it is. I mean, I, I I I can't really sort of overemphasize how much AI is and will continue to be an influence for us all, no matter who you are and no matter where you are. Um, you know, artificial intelligence, everybody has their own impression of what that is, but the title is very telling. You know, it's 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 about enabling computers. They might not look like a computer, but computing devices to be intelligent, to have the capabilities of of and beyond us humans. So being able to get computers to be able to to take in input, to hear, to understand speech, to to, to see, to understand images and um, to process figures and so on in a very fast way to play games, to do robotics and all sorts of things. So it's this concept of creating intelligence in devices or a, 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 to, to do um, to do ramped up intelligence, if you like, to do things in theory that are good for us all. I mean, that's that's my yeah. particular angle is to try to use artificial intelligence in a way that's to apply it in a way that's that's useful for us and for our society. 
Yeah, very interesting. And and it's definitely something that's at the core of so many of the advances at the moment. It's uh, it's very interesting just to hear about it from the perspective of kind of university work and college work as well. What what level of kind of research or development is um, is involved for for maybe the students of the courses that you'd, you'd be involved in teaching? Well, um, it, it depends on which one. So you know, we have students who are the undergraduate students and then we have the master's students and then we have the, the sort of in knee deep research students such as Fatima, who's with me, who's one of the PhD students. So, you know, we all of those students at different levels do projects in and around the domain of artificial intelligence. So if you're an undergrad student and we have many examples of these types of projects, they might be doing projects for their final year project where they go and they engage with a community partner or take an idea that they have where they apply artificial intelligence to a particular problem. And that's usually the output of that is something very practical. And then you go right up to the sort of research, the heavy duty research behind the scenes stuff that Fatima is working on, where you're actually working on the leading edge techniques. Not, o not only are you applying artificial intelligence, but you're actually making it work better, if you know what I mean. That's yeah. like kind of getting into the kind of hard algorithm and maths end of it. So we have the yeah, sort of full yeah. spec of those. Yeah, very interesting. So it really is kind of uh, looking at behind the scenes work here because we we kind of see the, the end results of a lot of this stuff. But uh, to see that the, the work that's going into the research and everything is is actually quite an interesting thing. Can, can you give us a bit of an idea? You mentioned there about examples of some of the projects that have been done. Can you give us a bit of an idea of the sorts of projects that have been completed in the past, maybe? Sure. And um, so, for example, we would have um, projects such as um, we would have, you know, if, if now this is in the general AI space, but we yeah. also, you know, and then there's the kind of assistive and accessibility type space. But in the general AI space, some of the projects that we're working on at the moment are we're working on a, a heartbeat application whereby you can take a heartbeat over through a mobile phone and detect via the phone whether you've got a healthy heart or not. Yeah. So that's something to be able to bring heart health oh, out yeah. to the masses. That's one example. Another yeah. one completely different is being able to, to find out the conditions of roads automatically. So being able to, based on images taken of roads, be able to say, do they need to have maintenance treatment done on them or not? You know, do they have potholes, yeah. do they have cracks and so on? So something close to the hearts of all Irish people. But, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing becomes really important when you go out to countries where they can't afford to do road maintenance and where the hazards of it become, you know, really the, the stakes are higher. That's aside from, yeah, yeah. you know, the Western countries need to, to maintain our roads too. Um, and, and there's other examples where we're, um, you know, in, in the case of fashion is the ones where we move more into the accessibility and uh, assistive technology space where we're doing yeah. projects around uh, learning tools for autistic children or learning tools for um, maths for people with uh, visual impairment. And we've done community projects with um, CRC and you know, we undertake a lot of very practical and research based projects with external parties and we love to do that. I mean, one of the things mm -hmm. TU Dublin is, is really passionate about is bringing research out of the lab and into the laps of the people who need it. That's that's yes. something that's really at the heart of what we do and and that's what we're trying to do with with this project. Yeah, and uh, and that's definitely kind of something as well that we're obviously really interested in as well. It's kind of really hitting at the, the core thing that we're we're thinking about for this show as well. Just thinking that I mean those different projects um aside from accessibility issues and assistive technology at the moment st straight away it's very varied even without that side to it it sounds like it must be a really interesting kind of uh, a role to be in oh it, it's unbelievably interesting i mean it, i i'd love to be you know if i could take on every project where i have an yeah. idea of how this this can be used to benefit people you know i just it, it's the time is is the limit and it's there's so much that can be done in these projects to apply artificial intelligence to worthwhile and and good problems that will you know make life better for people improve their quality of life and uh, make life safer make life richer and yeah. and it's kind of interesting because i think that sometimes the the image of artificial intelligence can be quite scary for people because they think of you know you sort of think of it's a kind of android angle and of people you know androids taking over the earth yeah. or people being put out of jobs by robots in warehouses you know all this kind of thing so there's 
there's the other side of AI where it's not about, you know, just removing jobs from people. It's about it's about filling in needs that for, to, to make life better and to yeah. make life, you know, richer for in, 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 a, in a host of different ways. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a really, really interesting sector. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that definitely does fit in very well to then accessibility issues and assistive technology, as you've kind of started to just allude to there, the, the, the uh, different ones that you would have worked with. How kind of, I suppose, how much of a, a prominent part of uh, of your role or how, how involved have you been in, in um, maybe some of the developments with um, accessibility and things like that? How, how much of a part has that played in some of the projects, for example? Well, for me personally, like TU Dublin have a, a, a long track record on accessibility projects of, of all types. For mm. me personally, it's relatively recent for me and mm. it's um, I've, I've, I've had, you know, various students over the years have of the undergraduate students have um, put their toe in the water with projects with me on building very practical things. So, so sort of smaller scale applications to help. You know, we built one for being able to choose your clothes from a wardrobe, or we built one for um, being able to learn maths through a voice aided computer, so that you wouldn't have to be able to see the screen. And you know, some specific things like that. But on the research side. Um, we're really getting in deeper with with projects like Fatima now um, that she has taken on, where we're now mm. applying um, the research into the access into specific accessibility projects. But there are various others by other individuals in TU Dublin where they're the use of um, being able to communicate um, using AI, speech to text, or vice versa, image captioning, where you identify what a picture is about, um, robotics, where you need minimal movement to do things. Um, autonomous movement of cars. It, there's there's a lot of research going on. It's directly relevant to the accessibility domain, um, and but it's not necessarily. And this is this is going right across the third level sector. It's not necessarily being fine tuned yet and put into a way that can directly be used for accessibility. And that's one thing that is 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 very interesting. That we might touch on later yeah, is yeah. how to make sure that the needs of people who have any sort of impairment or you know, accessibility requirements is put at the heart of the research so that they get what's what what we're capable of doing you know if you if a, if a car can drive can be can be um designed to, to be self driving you you've got a vehicle that in effect can see and you mm -hmm. know that's very powerful so you know th that technology behind that should be available to, to help humans to to capture what they can't see themselves to be able to get that help. So it's 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 really important. And this is part of I want what I want to do is to make sure that all these great capabilities in AI are being directed so that the human side of it, the people who need it gets a, a, a fair yeah. shot of being able to make use of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely um, such a key part. To, and it's just it's really interesting that you mentioned even things like um, driverless cars and things like that. We were actually just talking about that today and just the the elements that wouldn't necessarily um, originally have been maybe designed with um, accessibility or assistive technology in mind, but actually have that kind of oh, yeah. application or show where where that kind of uh, technology can be used as well. It's very interesting. So, yeah, really interesting to hear hear all your work that you're already doing. Maybe now at this point we can bring in Fatima and uh, you're very welcome to the show as well, Fatima. Um, hi, hi, yeah. good to have you with us. So Fatima, we'll, we'll talk about maybe the specifics of your project in just a moment, but can you tell us maybe just to start with a little bit about the inspiration for the project? Why did you want to develop this app that we're going to talk about in a moment that can help people with sight loss? Um, actually, my brief was to apply uh, AI to a real world problem in society, and I had the freedom to pick a problem to work on. Then by chance I read an article in a newspaper about the man with the uh, sight loss who cannot make a journey to his worship place by himself. I thought why is it uh, that people with vision impairment still cannot easily walk to uh, walk on a street um, journey independently and confidently while we are surrounded with uh, this di uh, with this uh, dramatic development in technology. 
from this point, I started to read more and more about the research done in this area and the real uh, world navigation application and advice to find their features and the gaps because uh, this uh, helped me to say that there is a gap if there is a, a complete um, applications that can help visual impaired people, maybe uh, they can use it and there's no problem, but it's actually there is a problem in the uh, in uh, in the area and I have to found them and uh, try to complete what is done because there is a huge working done in this area, but there is still uh, need a lot of work to done on this area to be uh, more uh, helpful for vi visual impaired people. Yeah, very interesting. So maybe Fatima, could you, could you tell us a bit more about your project specifically then? What does it involve? What's it about? Um, and just before um, Fatima, can I share a screen to, to support what Fatima is going to show? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, hopefully we can go ahead with that. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, that's there now. Yeah, you've got that there, John. Oh, thanks. Um, Actually, our project is about um, helping a person with uh, sight loss to feel more confident during walking on the street. So we thought about what kinds of problems they face. Can they plan for a journey? Could they choose the safest road? Um, could they cross the road? Uh, when a person is planning to take a journey on foot and he is deciding on a route, we thought about what typical maps applications such as Google Maps, for example, tell them. Uh, does it uh, enough to hold? Does it capture all needed information? And then we thought that there is another information that doesn't available on the current map, such as the location of intersections, the existing or not of pedestrian traffic light, crosswalk locations, ramps, and so on. And we thought that this kind of information helps in planning safer routes for a, per a person with vision impairment. So um, we're thinking about using uh, satellite image and street view image to collect useful information about street structures. And in this, we will use computer vision, um, deep learning to help us. This technologies will capture uh, the information for from the images and build a layer over the existing map. And using this updated map, a user can enter his start point and destination and choose his preference for suggested map, uh, suggested path, like avoid uncontrolled intersections, avoid intersections at all, avoid intersections with island in the middle. Having this street level uh, safety information on the map is our dream. Um, it is, will help people to feel more confident about planning the best route for a street journey. He will feel like he controls his route, um, avoid what he wants uh, and include what he wants. Then once the person set out for the journey, uh, our work is, will support them during the journey. The extra map information will enhance the guidance and instructions, um, letting them know, for example, where it is safe to cross the road. And during the, their walking journey, individuals with vision impairment need more support on various tasks, such as when traffic lights change, um, how to avoid obstacles. In summary, we aim to provide a comprehensive support for individuals with vision impairment during planning journey on foot and while walking along the street to a destination. Very good, yeah. Very interesting just to hear the different elements that are involved with that. Um, and, and obviously that, that kind of, that ties in a lot of different existing technologies as well, does it? It's kind of making, making more use of existing technology that's there to some degree as well, is it? Um, yes, we will use different uh, type of technology to support our work. It will involve the two particular technology within artificial intelligence, computer vision and deep learning. Mm, OK, very good. So just maybe to kind of clarify in our minds a little bit more, because there's a few different navigation um, apps that are out there at the moment. What, what specifically would you say kind of where does this fit in with um, other navigation apps or what's the kind of difference, if you like. 
Uh, yes, and in fact, there is a, a variety of other applications to help with the street navigation, and uh, it is worth to mention um, uh, this uh, here in case any of our audience are using this. Um, then I will explain how our uh, work is different. Uh, for example, um, Lazarello is an application that helps users to uh, choose means to travel around by walking, by bus, and so on. And um, it provides users with uh, guidance during the journey. It also uh, helps um, a user to explore his surrounding by providing a voice message about point of interest, uh, such as uh, banks and hospitals. Um, let's talk about Blind Square. It is another um, application that helps users to check his phones and get information about the current location and details about uh, locations around him. In addition, it provides users with intersections, uh, with the instructions to his destinations and information about public transportation in some countries. And also, uh, there is another kind of application such as Be My Eyes um, that provides uh, support by a sight person to help person with vision impairment during hard situation. Uh, the work that that we are doing adds to this app. Uh, right now, this app didn't give information uh, needed to say uh, where the safety features are when planning a journey with a map, such as the street, a junction, a traffic lights, zebra crossing, and so on. Secondly, our work will work towards uh, being able to interpret important things in the real time, such as the uh, color of the traffic lights, um, approaching an obstacle uh, such as road work, things on the street that are important for a person with uh, vision impairment, but it changes from moment to moment and uh, from hour to hour. Yeah, very good. Well, well, that's really interesting actually just hearing how that fits in with other apps that are out there, because obviously there's kind of slightly different functions for each of those different apps so it is quite interesting just to kind of see the space that it's that it's uh, designed to to fill um just kind of moving on from from that a little bit thank you very much for for talking to us about that specific um development but when it comes to a concept like that for example like that project that you've you've uh, been talking to us about there what kind of what work is put into that? What research has to be done? What work is involved to kind of move it on to another stage or how far will the project go? Well, the, the, there's a, a couple of different things there in that question, John Paul. Like the, to, to, to st our starting point is what's been done already because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So you start with the existing applications and you also start with how far has computer vision and deep learning, which are the te techniques we need to use, how far have they got generally and in this area? And <clears throat> what we discovered was the capability to be able to identify such a street level features from something like, you know, Google Earth or other satellite images, that capability is there, but it's not applied to being able to pick out, you know, where the the crosswalks are, where the, the junctions are, where the traffic lights are, that layer doesn't exist on a map at the moment. So the first thing we have to do is, and this sounds very sort of data driven, but we have to get the images in order to be able to drag out that information because there's two ways you yeah. can do it. You can either crowdsource it from people and get people to say, tell us what's near you and where exactly it is, or you can get an absolutely unambiguous location of where everything is. Now, there are some sources, you know, some cities have this sort of information, but it's absolutely inconsistent and not everywhere. So therefore, mm -hmm. we need to be able to do that. So one of the things we have to do is gather data and then test that with the latest algorithms to be able to see how well does it identify all the things that individuals with visual impairment need to be able to know. They need to know where to cross, where the crossing points are, what, where, what traffic lights are there, whether they're there, what type they are and all those other sort of safety features where there's a traffic island in the middle and those sorts of static things that you can have as an extra layer on a map. So that's yeah. that's it doesn't necessarily sound like a big piece of work, but to get that to the point that you can use, you know, some sort of open source of images uh, and be able yes, to yeah. just map that out for anywhere. Imagine how useful it would be to have that for any place that you would go to. Whether you're a person in Dublin or a person in London or a person in Baghdad or wherever. Yeah, yeah, 
Very good. So there, there's a, clearly an awful lot of work that goes into it to, to even get it off the ground in the first place. How yeah. likely is, is it that a project like this, for example, will get to the point where we'll be able to get it in our hands and, and be able to see it? Or is that the is that the idea behind this to get to an end point or is it as a research piece or what else is? That's a really good question because one of the things we really want to avoid is that this, you know, the, hitting the problem of this never getting out of the lab. And I think that's really important for projects where there are real people at the end who need this wrapped up in an application that they can use. So yeah. one of the things that is identified in in the area of um, accessibility and you know in, in making capabilities available to everybody is about bringing the eventual end user base in at the right time. And there's a really interesting um, paper out there by a person who called Peter Smith and Laura Smith. I don't know whether whether you've ever heard of them, who did a very good study from a very personal point of view about how mm. artificial intelligence, Peter Smith is an expert in artificial intelligence, who ended up un unexpectedly in a situation where he needed to deal with a disability that he he acquired and his daughter who's who's blind. And they assessed that there's loads of good stuff out there, but there's too much promise and too little substance was the title of their paper. And the big yeah. thing they come up with that we that we agree with is that you have to you don't wait until you're testing or evaluating an application or a technology. You bring the people in right at the beginning at the design stage. So part of the work that we're doing is and why we've been in contact with NCBI is to get the views of the user base and get their needs brought in. And we're, we're, we're shortly putting out in cooperation with NCBI a survey to the, the user base to find out what are their difficulties, you know, even with the apps that are around in navigating mm -hmm. around on streets, because we need to know that at the beginning, that'll help us bring the research out of the lab and into a real application because we'll do a better job of it. So yeah. our aim is to bring this in some sort of form of proof of concept to a point that we can then develop it out into an app. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. And and just kind of with the same idea really in mind as to what the future holds. It's maybe interesting just to get your perspective on what developments maybe you could see happening in the future with regards to to AI, both in maybe in everyday life, but also assistive or access, accessible technology. Well, I mean, in everyday life, the impact is, is just so big over the next, you know, decades to come. It's, it's hard to sort of know where to start because what's happening is what we think of as computers are just embedded in, in our environment. So, you know, everything is becoming more intelligent, whether it's, you know, this is a trivial example, whether it's your fridge automatically restocking itself for you or whether yeah. it's your, you know, Siri or Alexa or whatever it is you're into talking to. And you can start to see already how technology is becoming part of the fabric of everyday life. And this this intelligence you don't even need to see or touch if you take the kind of Siri example. Um, now, when it comes to accessibility, if you if you think about it, we're heading to the point where a let's call it computer is able to make sense of the world visually and through other senses, what is heard, what is brought in through text. In other words, the capabilities that we have as humans to be able to see and hear and speak will be available to a, a, a computer, an artificial device. And, and that's yeah. very powerful. If you start to apply that to accessibility and, and in the case of individuals with visual impairment, that's very powerful when you have something with you that can see and explain what has been seen. So I see, I'm very optimistic that we're hitting the point where we can really bring accessible technologies to the point that they that they can really do a better job of filling the gap of whatever the particular impairment or disability is. Yeah. And, yeah. and I see good things ahead, but we have to keep pushing for the users yes. to be involved in, in that design. It's really important. Yeah, very good. And it, it is really just very intriguing and interesting to think about the developments that could be in store in the next few years as well. So really appreciate you talking to us today, um, both uh, Susan and Fatima. 
for coming on to the live event this week and uh, for giving us a bit of insight into the projects that are happening at the moment, but also the direction that AI is taking in, in education and with accessible technologies as well. Thank you very much, Susan and Fatima. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much you. for having us on. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Very good. So uh, that was really interesting just hearing some of those developments. Now we're, we're going to return to this subject in just a moment, but just uh, before we do, um, before we talk to Alan Higgins, who's going to join us in a moment, we're just going to briefly cover our quick tips for this week. This week we're talking about alt text for images. JP, what can you tell us about that? So yeah, Jude, yeah, we, we're going to stay on the theme of, of accessibility this week and we're going to talk about adding alt text to images, as you just mentioned. Uh, so alternative text are also known as alt text. It's, it's basically descriptive text. And what it does is it outlines a meaning or a context of an image. And really what it's doing is providing a screen reader user with an understanding of images and documents, websites and, and social media posts that contain images. So often when uh, no alt text is provided and often we come across this a screen reader will be able to say um image or perhaps they'll hear image or perhaps they'll hear something like the file name itself um so that, that that's a big issue obviously but there's a few steps that we can take to add alt text to images and documents such as uh, word powerpoint or excel so i can just go through now yeah um, i'm also going to go through the relevant kind of keyboard shortcuts just in case anyone is using a keyboard to do it uh, so there's three or four steps first thing we need to do is just put focus on the image itself okay so you're, we're in a word document you want to put alt text add alt text to an image so we place focus on the image and what we need to do is to press shift and f10 or the applications key on the keyboard or what we can do is right click on the image if, if you are a sighted user and then we arrow down the context menu to where we hear edit alt text and then we press enter to select that and what, once we do that an alt text pane opens up on the right hand side of our screen in, in ms word and here we type in just one or two sentences of, of text into the text box to describe the image and its context of someone who, who just can't who can't see it and uh, so that that is three steps on, on what we need to do and um, to add alt text to images there's one or two tips and um, best to keep alt text is concise accurate kind of quite short generally not much longer than any any longer than one or two sentences um, now occasionally we might come across for example an infograph or a chart or, or um, you know some kind of a bar chart or, or pie chart something like that and it might need a longer description so what we can do is here is we can add text around the image or we can even provide like a hyperlink to another document that contains more descriptive text of, of what that image is is displaying yeah so that's that's a brief overview of how we had alt text to images in uh, say word or excel or powerpoint very good thank you very yeah. much for that jp yeah okay. very interesting just it. to to hear how easily that can be done yeah. as well. It's yeah. not something that takes great programming yeah. skill or anything yeah. to, it doesn't, to be able yeah, to do that. Quite, yeah. quite straightforward, yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. That's Thank you very much good. for that, JP. Yeah, so that's our quick tips for this week, adding alt text, alternative text to, to images there. Now let's return to the main subject for the show this week. And if you're just joining us, we're talking about how accessibility is being addressed in colleges and universities, for example, so in education. now. When new technologies are being developed, the earlier accessibility is considered in the process, the better. And to talk to us a bit about how that can be done, we have with us Alan Higgins, lecturer and researcher with the UCD College of Business. You're very welcome to the show, Alan. OK, how's that for audio? <laughs> That's better. Perfect. Thank you very much. Very good. So we'll maybe get straight into this, Alan, um, with uh, the phrase design thinking. Can you tell us a bit about what design thinking is about? So design thinking is kind of self-explanatory in a way. It's thinking about design. Um, it's a phrase that's come into, well, it's very popular um, in business for the last uh, five or six years and possibly slightly longer. It's been building up. It's a, it's a kind of headline title for a very distinctive kind of um, rapid prototyping development initiative in, in organizations. So it's a quasi consulting tool, quasi um, product design tool. And it, uh, it, it came out of the product design movement or, or industry. Um, and it's really gained uh, a lot of attention and, and um, um, credence in recent years because it's, it's allowing people in organizations to think differently about the products that they're developing and the services that they're, they're offering. 
Um, yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. So so that's the uh, kind of main subject of the of uh, one of the courses that you teach, isn't it? And uh, is that is that a course that's kind of also something that's fairly fairly recent to address that that movement in the business world, if you like? Yeah, so in the business world um, and business students at university level are you know, aiming to get go into the business world in, in a variety of career paths. Um, mm. And uh, these are the new kind of entrepreneurs of the next decade will come out of these these places. They, they, they're the people who are thinking in terms of new product development, um, new services. And um, so that entrepreneurial mindset and the entrepreneurial mindset comes with as kind of an assumption that you're taking action in the world. So you might not think of business students as designers per se, but in a sense they are. They're designing organizations, they're designing business models, and, and they work hand in glove with uh, engineers and computer scientists and artists and other creatives to produce the products that, that um, they sell or the services that they create. Um, so this class, this is a second year undergraduate class called Design Thinking, um, aims to sensitize our students to more than sort of the traditional kind of business management um, mindset, but also to incult, to br bring in that um, uh, design thinking as a way of a permission in a sense to change the world. Mm, very good and quite an interesting kind of concept for the for the course as well. I'm sure it must be uh, quite an interesting one to deliver. Just tell us maybe a little bit more about how that course works. I know we were talking a little bit before about um, rapid innovation, but how do you kind of introduce a, a concept like that into the coursework or how do you encourage something like that? So our students wouldn't be developers or designers originally or they might have an interest in it. Um, and uh, so in a sense, we're introducing the whole topic topic of product design to them and getting, in a sense, giving them the tools to think differently themselves and to see the world differently. Um, one of the, so design thinking itself has nothing to do with accessibility, at least on the, yeah. uh, from the outside. Um, it's a hu but it is a human-centered approach to innovation. And this is a quote from one of the um, founders of the sort of movement, so to speak, that um, it draw, it, it's a toolkit for designers that integrate the needs of people with the possibilities of technology. And that that point, the needs of people yeah. is central to design thinking as a process. And the way I've adapted this for teaching is that accessibility is the first and foremost um, need of people. That That's the need that's being addressed at the very outset in any um, design process. So yeah. uh, so it's, it's a design thinking class with a focus on accessibility. And that, that quote you read out there is actually quite a powerful one in itself, isn't it? Straight away kind of combining the, the power behind technology with what it can actually achieve uh, on the ground is amazing. Yeah, so this this idea of human centered, uh, it's been talked mm. about for many years in digital and, and software, um, human centered design, um, human factors in design. Um, but actually, you can get a bit caught up in the, the, the label human centered yeah. or human centered design, HCD as it's called, um, and actually lose sight of the fact that there's no general human and there's no average human. And yeah. so what we have is, um, and, and through the course, we we draw on a, a, a range of methods that we use in product design that will allow us to kind of think beyond the, the little, the square box of a standard user or, or a yeah. generic user. Yeah, very interesting. And we might come back to that again in a second, because that's quite an interesting concept in itself to explore. Have you got any kind of um, maybe examples of things that were worked on over maybe the first the first year of the because this has only been running a couple of years isn't it the, yeah, the class yeah, yeah mm. we're in the second year um, and so let me just put you in the, into the mindset of, of, of our students and why what they get what they take out of the class so yeah in a sense these imagine these students are going to go and work in a consulting firm or a state agency and they're in a, a business function and and they're attached to a project that develops some product or service. And um, one of the big failings in industry is that we don't actually design based on evidence very often. So mm. one of the skills, one of the skill capabilities we're giving our students is the um, awareness of and practice with 
one or more uh, of these innovative research methods. And these would be very much embodied kind of uh, observational rather than large scale statistical um, methods. They'd be very much focused on observation maybe, and yeah. sometimes elicitation, asking questions, sometimes prototyping where you, you try something out. Um, so they're, they're, they're very, um, they're quite a, a, a hands on and, and uh, open uh, set of research methods. And my, my dream is that these students um, become analysts or product owners and that their new product designs are based on evidence gathered in the field. And my students in their projects um, undertake um, the application of a couple of these methods and, uh, on a task or an activity of choice. So yeah. we've had, um, for example, one student last year shadowed a, a family a member who was a wheelchair user and um, observed how she encountered the built environment around um, her house in, in the village and, and shopping and the like. So um, anyone who's a wheelchair user um, is kind of confronted all the time with with the way the world has kind of been designed in a way against them in some sense, yeah. because there are steps everywhere or, or gaps or inclinations. Um, and so particularly if you're self propelling and um, the world really poses a lot of challenges. And when you're in that position yourself, you realize um, so as, as an able bodied person, maybe when when you're sitting in a chair and encountering the world, the doors that we that are everywhere and, and you realize, well, the people who built this didn't actually do this. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it like that. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah. So, it, you know, that, that student made some observations and findings that would be appropriate for um, the built environment in a village, yeah. for example. And yeah. similarly, students at UCD have to use a learning management system. And um, we use a, a currently use a system called Brightspace. And so that system, um, when you evaluate it using um, uh, 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 spoken commands or keyboard only, um, yeah. uh, it works to a point. And it's, yeah. it's interesting for them to discover where those points are and, and they'll also then put themselves in the position of being perhaps a designer or a product owner needing to design those 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 steps, let's call them, out of the, their systems. It's very interesting those examples that you give because that they're very good examples of exactly what you mentioned earlier, kind of marrying the idea of observing the world around you. What is the actual issues, and then and then taking that into the design process. I was struck by the the. Um, phrase you used a moment ago about how kind of design often doesn't isn't based on evidence, but that kind of observational approach and really making sure to to dig deep into real world experience is is a key factor in in kind of making sure that it is based on on the evidence really, isn't it, by the sense of it? Absolutely. Um you want to that's why one of the approaches we use in design thinking, and this is broadly speaking, not just on accessibility, and that is yeah. before you go and build something, prototype it with the lowest cost possible prototype. So we talk about paper prototypes, mock ups, um, and you role play the use of a thing. You might be using a card deck with different screens or a PowerPoint deck to um, mock up how an application or an app would work. Yeah. And, and and that 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 just puts the it, it sort of breaks open the design process before you've committed all your invested all your your, your time and effort in into a sort of a, a narrow sort of um, uh, avenue. You're 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 getting yeah. feedback early. Yeah, very good. It's interesting actually just to think about the different kind of obstacles along the way, because when, when you're talking again about the, the research that goes into making sure design is based on evidence and then you prototype it and you go through this whole process, the, some of the obstacles of kind of getting to that point, the way that people lean instead of evidence based things, the kind of the, the unspoken things or the unconscious ways that they lean towards things in the design is quite interesting. I was struck by a, a term in um, actually just reading your blog, the term human cognitive bias. Tell us a bit about how that can maybe affect the design process for maybe for to the detriment of the design process. Yeah, um, well, look, um, a lot of products are designed by individuals. Uh, they start small 
Um, and most designers in a way are designing for their own needs or what they perceive to be the needs that they see. Um, and we're all blind to the world in different ways. We, we, we're, we all have our own biases and assumptions. And often it's the, we, you've heard of the Johari um, analysis to sort of the side of yourself that you don't, you know certain amount of information about yourself. That there's mm. the, you don't, you don't know what you don't know about yourself, and they're your biases that are that are kind of um, in, intrinsic to you. Um, here, here's an interesting one. You wouldn't think of it, but essentially all users are accessibility users at some level of of a computer or the the built world, um, because we're all using the environment in very deliberate ways. So we're not even conscious, perhaps, uh, as a sighted user of a computer, of how dependent we are on the pointer, on the and that in combination with the, the keyboard and, and that sort of synthesis between your hand motion with a, a pointer mouse yeah. or what have you. So we're all yeah. accessibility users at, at some level. Um, and so designers have these these blind spots themselves. They, they design for what they think is, is the thing is going to be used for and they just can't see. So that's why we need to bring uh, uh, diversity into the design process as early as possible. Mm, yeah, very interesting. So it's kind of like somebody is spotting that there's a need, but then when they're designing it, they're designing it the way that they would use it if they were in somebody else's position. But it's not quite it's not quite taking the needs of the other person into account, or at least not always taking the needs of the other person into account, which is quite interesting. Yeah, now, the designers deliberately try to empathize and try to put themselves mm. in the shoes of their users, but they're not even really that aware of of what their users perceive. Yeah, um, and yeah. one of the simulators we'd have our, our students um, utilize would be Novartis um, have a, a, a visual simulator of um, different degrees of visual impairment, the via Opta simulator. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not a perfect simulator by any means because you look at the world through your smartphone or, or, or tablet and you see a, a distorted view, um, the camera adjusts the image as such, and yeah. you're not even, <clears throat> it doesn't track your focal point. So you, even if there's a, 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 a gap of, um, of, of um, uh, mm -hmm. in your eye, you, you, it, you, you don't it doesn't follow your eye around so it's it's an impartial it's it's a partial view of the world but it does give them a sense of give us a sense of what it's like to to have uh, that condition and to try and use a device with that that level of, of, of visual occlusion for yeah. example yeah yeah very good it's it's uh, definitely quite interesting just when you were talking there a moment ago about like even even the mouse pointer I, I remember my first um the first training session I ever did, um, and I was I was training a class that was, I, I think that the, the people who were who had been signed up to the class maybe one or two would have ideally been on a beginner's course first, but I hadn't really thought of that. And I remember going to use the mouse pointer, and one really struggled with the idea that it was connecting, moving the mouse around with this thing that's moving around on the screen. And I just remember that was quite an interesting kind of little insight straight off and it ties in very much with what what you're saying there there's so much that we're unconscious of with how we use something that it's really important to get over that kind of uh, as you say that the um what was the term human cognitive bias or, or related yeah. kind of issues yeah um yeah. tell us just uh, it's kind of bringing in another term here but it's it's almost like one of the solutions to that what's um persona based design all about Right, yeah, so personas um, come out of, well, they're, they're referred to in software engineering um, specifically, and that's my background, um, oh, around the turn of sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, a fellow by the name of Alan Cooper, who uh, is the uh, was the inventor of Visual Basic from Microsoft, and he yeah. went on to essentially found the human-centered or, or prompt the human-centered design movement. And, and one of the tools he uh, suggests that a product design team should apply is this method called personas. And so rather than um, designing for uh, a demographic user, they would design for a user who is given a, an identity and a biography and a character and particular qualities. So instead of an average yeah. user, they design for a person with um, a particular age, a name, 
uh, a history, a cultural context, uh, physical abilities. Um, and so, yeah, so persona based design is a really powerful design tool for a team to adopt because it allows them to keep their the users, real users, um, very much kind of uh, on the team uh, conceptually without actually having those people present. They're, they're not actual people, um, but they're, yeah. they're sort of. Um, so I was really impressed that um, that uh, this this idea has been taken up by WCAG in the um, internet um, guidelines for accessibility, and they yeah. provide a, a seri series of personas for teams to just adapt to to their need. And I also have a, a set of personas here called the alphabet of accessibility, and this is a, a set of personas for game designers to consider their users. And of course, all products, uh, generally speaking, should address the needs of a varied audience. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And uh, that kind of ties in. We, we talked about um, gaming for people with sight loss a few weeks ago on one of our live events, and that was quite an interesting discussion as well. It's interesting when you talk about persona based design and, and what that actually means, because the connection becomes quite clear when you describe it. The connection com becomes quite clear for people with sight loss and how um, things can be designed right in the design phase to make sure that accessibility is a core part of it. Um, how, how much of an impact would you say these design principles can have when it comes to levelling the playing field for someone with sight loss, for example? I, I think it's about awareness raising more than having a big impact. I, th I think, well, that is the impact really, to be aware. Um, yeah. the, the good thing with personas is they can be there at the very beginning of your, your design process. Um, even the individual designer can have a conceptual set of personas that they can think of as their audience for the product or service that they're developing. But the, the, the important thing I, I want to sort of highlight is that it's not sufficient in itself, this kind of abstract person. And that's why I, I hope my students, when they go into industry, they'll apply personas and other techniques, shadowing and, and um, ethnographic techniques and observational techniques. But I actually, more so than anything, I want them to, at, at a particular point in the design process, bring in experts from the field. So um, people with sight loss, people with uh, uh, physical um, dis disability or who have a particular need for that product um, bring yeah. them, they're the experts. And, and one thing that's very clear when students um, simulate uh, acquired um, um, uh, disability of some kind or uh, that they're actually, they struggle a lot. Um, whereas somebody who's lived with it for years has, has a acquired the skills to work the computer effectively without the mouse, um, mm. without the screen. Um, they're the experts and they're the people who should be brought into the process as early as possible too. It could be for a week, it could just be for a, a design sprint. Um, yeah. And as, as a, a putative customer, um, uh, but they're the people I think we need to bring in um, yeah. more frequently. Yeah, yeah, very interesting and uh, definitely just, I mean, sticking with the, the idea, I suppose, of the impact and the potential impact that these kind of uh, approaches can have on the world of accessibility and assistive technology and things like that. Um, what what would you um, hope to see or expect to see in the next few years, maybe? Oh, yeah, this is a tricky one because um, I, I think um, captioning and, and uh, all the sort of uh, additional, um, it's not even additional, the sort of built in, the WCAG's functionality for the web is kind of now integrated into apps because apps are the web these days. Mm -hmm. And so all of that accessibility technology is available by default. For example, you, you've, I'm sure you've spoken with um, some of the big uh, tech companies and, mm. and they're bringing accessibility both into the core of their products, but also the tools that build those products. One of the really exciting areas I, I, I love to see is, is voice um, recognition control. Um, yeah. But I feel a bit like a, um, whenever I try that, it, um, my, my family get uh, a, a bit miffed because uh, it's, it's a bit weird to, to talk <laughs> to a computer, isn't it? And of course, it's okay when you do it on your own, but uh, 
you can't really imagine saying hey computer in a crowd and, yeah. and working in a multi set multi user setting can you but i think mm. that's really exciting to have that kind of level of functionality driven by the web actually through through broadband as opposed to on a local device as such so yeah. voice activation yeah. voice interaction yeah absolutely i think it's been fascinating actually all, all the way through the show today to hear the kind of developments that are that are there at the moment the kind of work and research that's going into making sure that the next few years is going to be delivering on an awful lot of these things so it's absolutely fascinating to to uh, talk to you about some of those design concepts and principles that have the potential to to really have an impact on accessibility not just now but in the years to come as well so really appreciate you coming on to the show today to talk to us alan Thank you, Jude. Thank you, JP. Great to great to talk to you. So thank you very much. That was uh, Alan Higgins joining us uh, from the UCD College of Business. So really interesting show that we've had this week. Nice discussion with uh, Susan and Fatima and Alan. But just before we finish up this week, we have uh, just one question for our tech help section. Um, so I think Sean is going to help us with this. Uh, the question this week that we had in was just in relation to spell check when when i press f7 in microsoft word spell check doesn't seem to be working anymore any ideas why not there was a recent update uh jude so it does it, do, it does do a spell check but it opens up a new uh, system called editor and from there you can change your spellings like you could in spell check but also your grammar and other refinements in terms of clarity conciseness and formality etc so it does work slightly differently um, when you F7, you can down arrow to corrections and then down arrow between spelling and grammar. But you have to tab to get to your refinements if you want to change if there's any errors in clarity or conciseness, you'd have to tab to that section, down arrow yeah. to them and press enter to go into those um, different sections. But if, if, if people need help with that there, we can do a more in-depth review of it. But just to let people know that spell check is still there. It's just a new system called editor within Microsoft Word. Very good. And, and that could be an interesting one for us to talk about on a future live event as well, just to talk about that a little bit. Cheers for helping us out with that, Sean. No problem. Very good. So that's just about it for our show this week. But before we go, just a reminder again, of course, that if you want a bit more of a hand with any of the things that uh, we talk about regularly on our live events, you can get support from the labs team from nine to five, Monday to Friday on 1850 92 30 60, or you can email labs at ncbi.ie. Or if you want to avail of wider NCBI services, you can call 1850 33 43 53 or email info at ncbi.ie. And if you'd like to make a donation to support our services, well, you can also visit donate.ncbi.ie and maybe you'd even like to sponsor one of our live events. Well, you can do that as well by contacting labs at ncbi.ie and that can help just to keep the, the live events going as well. Just before we go, just a reminder of what we'll be talking about in future live events. We've been flagging this for a few weeks. We're going to be talking about the Sky accessibility features. Now, we have flagged that a few times, but we'll be covering that. That's uh, in for next week. We're going to be talking about uh, Sky accessibility features, the new accessibility features and how uh, useful they can be. And in a few weeks, we're going to be talking about another NCBI initiative, just what's happening in uh, Tala at the moment. So the NCBI Centre of Excellence in Tala and uh, that'll be really interesting just to hear a little bit more about that. Just uh, a, again, a reminder of the next live event. The date for the next live event is our, is next Tuesday, April 27th at 2.30 p.m. But the following week, given that there's a bank holiday on the week, just to give you advance notice, we won't have our live event on that week. So uh, there'll be a, a gap in the in the schedule there. But we are back next week, April 27th at the usual time of 2.30 p.m. And if you want to stay up to date with what's happening on our live events, as well as plenty more, of course, you can subscribe to our newsletter on our website or you can email us at labs at ncbi.ie if you'd like to do that as well. So all that's left for me to do is to thank our guests today. Alan and Fatima and Susan and of course thanks to everyone listening in as well and from JP, from Sean, Daniel and myself goodbye for now and we look forward to having you all back with us next week for another NCBI Labs live event.